Welcome back guys, it's Cheats back with another video that no one asked for. As you can see from the title, we are going to be doing like a little bit of a history class lesson. Take out your pens and papers, notebooks, notepads, I mean whatever you got. We are talking about the history of skincare, particularly, oh English, particularly talking about skincare and black women. What has been the evolution of black women using skincare? Was it always easily accessible for us? You know, trying to go through the time. Before there was like Fenty skin and like all these like black owned businesses and just like all these options. What was happening before then? What were we using on our skin? This video is almost like a series. So I'm gonna do one for skincare and then one for makeup. And particularly for skincare, we are going to be focusing for two parts. So it'll be a two part video. Excuse the pasta, I know it's a reactor pasta, but these are the ones that work. This video will be talking about more about like the facts, history, going to class. And then the next video will be more of a personal take. So speaking to some of the women in my life and just asking them about their history of their skincare use and maybe even my own i'll see depending on how i'm feeling let's get into it so when i was trying to like research for this video there wasn't i wasn't getting what i needed to get internets weren't giving what they needed to give yeah i guess it's because i mean in the end it's easy to say now in the situation we're in but skincare skincare shouldn't necessarily be that different depending on your skin tone obviously some things will differ because different skin tones are more inclined to get different like tough skincare problems and all that stuff but in essence skincare is skincare i went all the way back all the way back to the early 1900s when i think 1900s i think titanic which was the first ever movie that I ever watched like in the cinema. I don't know why, because I was like way too young to be watching that. And I actually thought they were acting out the movie in the sides and the curtains there. I remember, uh, anyway, that's a whole different story. Early 1900s, we had Annie Malone. I'll, maybe I'll remember to throw in a picture, maybe I won't, but we're here now. Annie Malone was, you could say she's one of the, the first or commercially available black skincare owners. So there might have been some that weren't known at the time, but she was commercially available. What she did was, you know, she just started experimenting, cooking up some things back in the day. Like, I think we're like 1902-ish. Like, we are early in the 1900s. I think, I don't know what fashions, because it wasn't the flapper era. I don't know what it was. Black people were definitely not, like, having businesses like that. So she started a brand called Poro. The black, the African woman wants to be like Poro, but Poro skin and hair. Um, so mostly skincare and hair products. And this was, especially in that era, the skincare products would be like vanishing creams. I think Pons still does this, but very like old school types of types of skincare, vanishing creams, cold creams, and it's really stuff that you put under like your foundation. And these were super successful like really successful and this ties into what we'll talk about a bit later in the video just that whole narrative of people thinking or big brands thinking that the black community won't buy beauty products this was in the 1900s where just being black was really just touch and go and this brand was still really successful it was black owned for black people and did well she became like one of the first black female millionaires in the beauty industry so i mean so annie malone did a thing did a thing and then later on also in the early 1900s we have madam cj walker so i know there's a movie on netflix that i watched like last year or something um so we mostly know her for like hair products right even the movie focuses on her hair products for um black women parents were previously enslaved so we're, it's really like grassroots the grassroots like we're in, we're in the grass yeah so she got bored also started making up some things trying to make a business for herself like i mentioned just now mostly hair and also some skin some skin products the business really grew when she got married the husband was like you know kind of a businessman sort of thing they grew the, the grew, they grew the brand that's when they introduced the skincare and fun fact fun fact see this is all full circle moment she was actually trained by guess who Full circle moment. I mean, come on, Oprah can't make this stuff up. So yeah, so she was trained by Annie Malone and then developed her own products. She was super successful, super rich, products worked, but then, you know, life happened. She passed away and then, you know, life, brands get bought and all, all that nonsense. Fast forward through some time, also let's say like the mid 1900s, we also had another brand called Cashmere Chemical Company and they had a brand called Nile Queen. And this brand was super successful um also black owned and targeted towards black women skincare products doing its thing then 10 years into its success 
you know, the man came, the man being Procter & Gamble, PNG, which is, I mean, a conglomerate that we know now. So PNG, like in this day and age, own brands like Olay, um, First Aid Beauty, they own a lot of brands, not just in beauty, but just, I mean, in, in the world. And they were like to Kashmir, and they're like, Kashmir. Um, this Kashmir, what is a Kashmir chemical company? That name sounds way too familiar to one of our brands called Kashmir. So obviously Procter & Gamble being the big like company it is, and you know how the story goes, Giant, David and Goliath, that whole thing. They like sued Kashmir. Kashmir, Kashmir won, right, this black owned company. They won, so like, yeah. But the whole like legal battle and just the shenanigans destroyed the company. So now they were broke and now they couldn't keep going, even though they won the lawsuit to keep their name. It just like, it just wasn't the same, you know? It was never the same. And that's also, that plays into a bigger narrative of these small brands that try to provide the black community with products aimed for us, for us, by us, FUBU, you know? Just being either bought out by big brands and then switched up or just being taken out by lawsuits and just pretty much being monopolized. That still happens to this day. That still happens to this day. Just like with small businesses in general, especially like small black businesses. That's why it's so hard for them to, to get in there because these big companies just come with shenanigans and, you know, beat them up. So throughout time and the whole like in the 90s, well the, let's say 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, that whole era of just nonsense in society, we had, we had some more brands come up, you know, come and go, aim for like darker skin. But what was starting to happen is that these big brands realized that, oh, if we actually target some of, some of these brands to black people, they actually do buy it. Like, you know, they can spend a coin. And what, there's something about us is we like to spend money on like nice things, right? But then what they started to do, ulterior motive, is start to sell products or market products towards the black community, but products that weren't necessarily good for us. So now we've got skin lightening, bleaching, those types of things. So yes, they're selling us products, but it's with their own motive, right? And but that's a whole different video. That's a whole different video, but you can, you can see where I'm going with that. Even now, let's like fast forward all the way to like, let's say the 90s and like early 2000s. I remember growing up, right? Like seeing magazines and video ads, because now we, now, we, now we have accessibility to stuff. So another thing that ties into this whole conversation is accessibility to media, to, to shopping in general, just products, is that back in the day, we did, as a black community, in most, in most countries, we, we didn't have that much money. So we didn't grow up like seeing a lot of media, right? Just because like TV and magazines were expensive. So you actually just didn't know what you're meant to be using and you weren't exposed to a lot of these products. So they were, they were getting exposed to like their, their demographic, they call their buy it. So the products that were being talked to us, people would buy, which would be the bad products, like with the bleaching and stuff. Um, but we didn't know that there was like a whole lot more out there and that we don't have to specifically buy black skincare. But you know, later on, as the world changed and got better, we started being more exposed to a lot of different things. However, with that exposure, we still saw some things that just weren't right. And when I look back, I'm like, wow, I was really just being propaganded. Because I look back at even, let's say the 90s and the 2000s, so we're fast forwarding all the way. A lot of the media coverage, a lot of like the ads I'd see, even like in teen magazines I'll be reading, hashtag 17, you see ads of like, a cute white girl, nothing, nothing wrong with her. Um, you know, like let's say Neutrogena ad. I mean, they, those are those are like really popular for skincare. You know, doing those splash on the with the water on the face. But I never realized until I got older how much that was impacting how I saw skincare and myself in the whole beauty industry. You know, it definitely defined my beauty sort of standards. But again, another video. There's so many side roads to this, to this conversation. I didn't actually, I never thought of it that way. I guess what I'm trying to say is, although now as the black community were more exposed to stuff, um, generally, it was still being exposed to very um, sort of white marketing, right? So because of that, 
there's still the mentality of, okay, these products aren't for us. Like, our skin, we don't, our skin doesn't need that. A big stereotype that comes across is black people don't need um, sunscreen. And you know my thoughts. You know my thoughts. If you don't know my thoughts because you're new, welcome to new subscribers. Um, wear sunscreen. I'll just end it there. Otherwise, we're gonna. We're literally gonna, <laughs> we're gonna rock. So you just kind of think like it's not for you. And you just start using the soap that is in the house and the body lotion on the face because my parents found out like later on in the game when they were working and more exposed and you know that, oh, I actually need to take care of my skin. But like throughout most of their childhood, they didn't know. So it only came into their lives like later on. And for us now, like our generations, but it's, it's definitely a lot better. I almost said a bit, but it's definitely a lot better. But there's still room for improvement, you know. There's still... Mm -hmm, mm hmm Also, let's say from the 90s, 2000s, you will see a lot more of these huge companies, right? So let's take like your Clinique is a good example. And this actually ties into the second part of the video. So take a brand like Clinique, which started to advertise more. It's a brand that's like really well known throughout different races, different countries, different demographics, all that stuff. And they come out with skincare routines that they are one to three step thing i don't know if it was three or five but that one you know that one with like the different color bottles and because that is one of the biggest beauty brands and can really just get their name out there in the depths of africa you see that people are like okay you know as they're starting to see like maybe i need to take care of my skin they'll be like okay clinique is out there let me try clinique right and i think clinique you know, did start using some different shades in their ads and all that stuff. So that, that, I'm actually very happy I chose Clinique. And that routine, their, their step program, whatever, became super popular. Um, a lot of young black people, obviously it's expensive, so not everyone could like start with that. But a lot of people started with that because you also don't know anything about ingredients. I'm talking back in the day. A lot of people didn't know about like skincare ingredients, what you actually needed, that, 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 those steps in that thing aren't for everyone's skin, you know. Your skin could be super dry and there you are adding more retinol, for example. I'm just, just an example. But we still didn't know what was in there, but it was just marketed so well across all the demographics that we went, we went. And now it's like new money things, right? So we're like, hey, let me go get my clinic. But still might not be for you. So that ties into what I was saying earlier of big brands. Now, you know, targeting us a little, but still not the products that are meant for us. It's ingredients that might not be necessarily good for our skin or don't address our, our sort of problems. You know, for a lot of black people, one of the biggest concerns is hyperpigmentation and like dark scarring. And it's not the same as for a lighter skinned person. So those issues were still not being addressed and, you know, kind of tackled for us. We were like, hey, you know, at least I got my clinique, so I'm good. But now when I look back, right, it's so crazy to see the shift. I mean, it's still, like I mentioned, there's still like room for growth and change. Oh, I have this t-shirt, why am I wearing this? Y'all didn't tell me? This is my home t-shirt. Forgot to change. Anyway, there's still room for growth, but I do, even when I speak to like my mom and like my aunt and stuff, they now understand their skin better. They now will go to, um, even if it's a drugstore or wherever they're getting their skincare, knowing their concerns. They might not be too familiar with the ingredients, but they kind of know their concerns and will ask for products for that. No one is sticking to a full, you know, brand routine anymore. People just mixing and matching. So it's very interesting to see. Also, a lot more black owned businesses for us. Um, even if they're not black owned, the white owned companies, for example, are now targeting us or marketing towards us. Um, it could still be better, but it's happening. It's happening because guys, black don't crack. So I feel like you're actually, you're missing the bag by not targeting us. And like I said, we like to spend money on things, especially here in Africa. So we've come a long way with skincare in terms of um, skincare and black people, um, accessibility to it, marketing of it to us just our general usage of it. We're no longer just using the bar soap at home. We're really, we're kind, we're kind of trying. But I mean, I still do see some, some products that are kind of trying to play us a bit. You know, you get a lot of even like moisturizer, even tone, what, what, what. And you know, those, unfortunately, those still have a hold on people. Um, of darker skin, but again, that's a whole different story and a whole different social 
situation. Once you get out of that chokehold, there's a whole new world, a brand new, a whole new world. Dun, 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 dun. I don't know the words. Anyway, so yeah, so I hope you enjoyed this brief history. The next video will be a continuation of this, and I'll be interviewing different generations and asking them about their skincare throughout the time. So I'm going to be speaking to, you know, 50 to 60s, 40s to 50s. I'm in the 30s, so I guess I'll have to throw myself in there, and then a Gen Z just for you know, for some funk. And yeah, hope you guys enjoyed. Please make sure to li hit like. The Please make sure to like, subscribe, notification bell, 5k subs. Let's go.